Hi, this is Anthony Walter from the Venti Anglican Church, 10 o'clock service. A reading from the Holy Bible, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he has chosen us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having a predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are our God's possession. To the praise of His glory. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thanks, Anthony, for reading for us. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that Jesus would be lifted up and honoured and exalted right now as we come to your word. And we pray that the things that are said would be true of you and bring glory to your name. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why are you a Christian? I mean, really, when it boils down to it, why is it that you are saved? Did you make the decision to follow Jesus or did it start with God? And if I asked you that question, what would your answer be? You might say, well, I'm a Christian because I believed. And I'd ask you, well, why did you believe? And you might say, well, because my eyes were opened. And I would say, but why? Why is it your eyes were opened and others weren't? And you might say, well, I saw my own sin. And you might say, but why? Why did you see your own sin? Are you more humble than other people? Are you smarter and wiser than anyone else? And you might say, well, I repented. And I'd ask you, well, why did you repent and others didn't? And you might say, well, I opened up. And I would say, well, how come you opened up and someone else didn't? Are you, are you a Christian because you're more insightful than everybody else? You've seen things that other people haven't seen. And you might say, ah, the Spirit worked in me. And I would ask you, why did the Spirit work in you and not in that person? See, when it boils down to it, either you're a Christian because you're smarter and wiser and more insightful than anyone else, or God opened your heart. In other words, he chose you. And I want you to see today that you actually believe in this thing called predestination that we're going to be talking about. We're continuing our series called Salvation's Golden Chain, and we're focusing just on two verses in Romans 8, verse 29 and 30, and we're examining the great doctrines of foreknowledge and predestination, being called and justified and glorified, 
and we're thinking about each of these doctrines as a link in an unbreakable chain which shows us God's plan for our salvation from eternity past to eternity future. And today we come to the second link in the chain, predestination. That's the doctrine that says that God in eternity past has chosen some and not all for eternal life. You know, just like you might elect someone and choose someone to show them your love, God has chosen some for eternal salvation. Now, as we come to this doctrine, we should take our shoes off because the ground on which we're walking is holy ground. We're dealing with some great mysteries within God that he has revealed to us. This is not trivial stuff. You know, once I asked some guys at a barbecue what they thought of predestination, um, someone said, it's an amazing thing. Another guy said, it causes fights. Someone else said, um, is that the name of a movie? Look, this is a contentious topic, but it's also amazing stuff. I want you to think, think of predestination as like a hard-boiled lolly. It's hard on the outside, but when you bite into it, it's soft and it's sweet on the inside. And... It can be hard to swallow this uh, topic, but if you understand this doctrine of predestination, it, let me tell you, it's going to be one of the most greatest comforts and supports in your life. It will be so sweet to you and get you through so many hard times. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to consider, first of all, the hard facts of predestination, then we'll look at the sweetness of predestination, and then we'll think about the swallowing of predestination. Okay, the hard facts, the sweetness, the swallowing. So first, the hard facts of predestination. Let's read our text from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. In other words, the ones that God foreknew, are the same ones he also predestined. Now we saw last week that when God foreknows you, it's not that God looks into the future and he looks and sees who would believe in him and those are the ones he chooses to be saved. That's not what foreknowledge is. No, when the Bible says that God foreknew you, it's saying that he foreloved you. It's telling us that even before you were born, God put his love on you in eternity past. And the ones that God foreloved, those are the ones he predestined. Now this word predestined means to decide beforehand. To decide your destiny beforehand. God decided beforehand what your destiny would be. He decided that you would be his own. He decided to choose you for salvation in Christ. Why? Simply because he loved you. Let me try and illustrate this. A, a few years ago, I saw an ad in the local paper. It was a picture of the cutest Jack Russell that you could ever see. And the ad said, free to a good home. And I thought, well, I've got a good home. And I looked at the picture and I thought, what a cute dog. And I set my affection upon that dog. I hadn't seen her. I hadn't met this dog. But I made a choice. I wanted this dog. I could have had any dog, but I chose this dog. So I went to the house down in Kellyville, and I met the woman who was the owner, and she introduced me to this dog, and she told me, well, you know, this dog barks all night and drives the neighbors crazy. She rips up plants. Are you sure you want this dog? And she was telling me that this dog would be trouble, and she was. And maybe I'll save those stories up for another sermon illustration another time. But I made a choice, you see. I pre-loved her, and then I elected her to be my dog. And... What I'm saying is before time, God made a choice to take you for his very own. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians 1. 
He said, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That's what Paul says, that you're chosen, you're, you're predestined. Another apostle, Peter, he says the same thing in 1 Peter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. See, Peter says the same thing. He uses this language of elect. But Luke, when he writes about the gospel first going out, and people becoming Christians, here's what he says in Acts 13, he, verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honoured the word of the Lord and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. So he uses this language of, of people being appointed by God to eternal life. And Jesus uses this language of elect as well. He says in Luke 18, verse 7, Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? See, he uses this language of elect. Peter, Paul, Luke and Jesus all talk about the fact that God has his chosen ones. That, that long before you chose God, he actually chose you. Now, why did God need to do that? Why did God need to choose you and us? Well, it's because, long be, be, it's because you could never choose God by yourself. Here's what Romans 8 verse 7 says. It says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. See, our mind is hostile to God. When it comes to the God of the Bible, the God who's in control, who made this world and tells us what's right and what's wrong, we don't want to have anything to do with that God. We don't want that God in our heart of hearts. We're hostile to that God. There's nothing in our sinful hearts that desires God. We're his enemy. That's what it says. And, you know, you can even be a very, very good person and you can say, I'm so good, I don't need God. He can just leave me alone. You know what that is? That's being hostile to God. You can use your goodness as an excuse to avoid God. That's being hostile to God. You see, left to our own inclination, we don't want God. We don't want to have anything to do with him. And if you don't know that about yourself, then, my friend, you don't know your own heart. We're so happy to ignore him and be hostile to him. And the Bible speaks about us like this. You know, it says things like that we're spiritually dead, that we've turned away from God, that we've wandered away from him like lost sheep, that we've, we're blind, we're deaf, we've followed the devil, we've followed the ways of the world. We, we're following our desires and the thoughts of our sinful nature. We have no inclination or attraction towards God. Take it from the Bible. That's what the Bible's saying, what we're like. You see, you're not smarter and more humble than anyone else. You're not better than others. You're just as bad as the rest of us. See, if you think that you're not better than others, then guess what? You believe in predestination. Because God doesn't look into the future and pick who has the best faith. Because none of us had faith in the first place. We were dead in our sins. We were like a corpse. We needed someone to step in and intervene and breathe life into us. And thank goodness that God chose to intervene. You see, it's not based on your choice. A corpse doesn't have a choice. All right? It's not based on your choice. It's based on God's choice. And last time I checked, his plans don't change. And if he has chosen you, then he's not going to change his mind. These are the hard facts of predestination. And you might ask, you might very well ask, is this fair? How can God choose some people and not others? Look, do you know it's only unfair if we deserve to be chosen? I mean, think of it this way. 
Imagine you're in a big family and your dad says, we're going to have a big family reunion, stuff COVID-19, we're going to invite everyone, the cousins, the uncles, the grandmothers, the grandfathers, everyone. We're going to have 50 people over for a barbecue. And you say, no way, we're only allowed to have 20 people. Don't you know the health orders? Don't you know what will happen if you get caught? There'll be a thousand dollar fines each for everyone. And your family says, I don't care, we're all going, we're going to get together. Together, and you argue and argue but they're hostile and they won't, won't listen and you say fine but I'm not going and you decide you know I'm, I'm going to intervene and what you do is you pick some people in your family and you stop them from going to the family reunion and you you know you sneak up to their house and you let the tires down of their cars and what you do is on the day you stop 10 people going but the rest still go and sure enough, the police show up at the family reunion, which you're not at, and they knock on the door and they do the head count, over 20 people, and everyone gets slapped with a $1,000 fine, right? And everyone finds out that you stopped 10 people from going. And they say to you, that's not fair, you stopped 10 of us from going. But you didn't stop us. It's all your fault that we got fined. You should have stopped us as well. What would you say to that? <laughs> you know what you'd say, don't you? You'd say, well, I did warn you, but you wouldn't listen. Um, I, I didn't have to stop any of you from going. You all deserve to be fine. Um, but I didn't have to intervene at all. You made the decision. You see, it's not unfair. You can't say God's unfair in choosing to intervene and save some when all of us deserve to be punished by God. See, God can intervene and save anyone he, he wants. He can save whoever he chooses. Look, this is the same God that said of him in Psalm 115 verse 3, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Daniel 4.35 says, no one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? See, it's only unfair if we deserve to be safe, but we don't deserve to be chosen. And that, friends, is what makes it so sweet. This doctrine is not to make us worry about the people that he hasn't chosen. It's, it's told to us so that when we see this doctrine applied to ourselves, we'll see how sweet it is. So let's think about the sweet, sweetness of predestination. One of the sweet things that happens when we understand this, is character change. Look at Romans 8.29. It says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. See, why has God chosen you? He's chosen you so that you will become like Jesus. You will share the family likeness. You're destined to take on the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God has planned for you, to be like him, to be holy and blameless and humble and gentle and wise and strong and courageous and sacrificial and serving, just like the beautiful character of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a privilege to grow up to be like him. We haven't been chosen to sit back and be complacent. We've been chosen for the greatest privilege possible to be like Jesus. So, are you growing to be more like him? Are you changing? Are you living out the purpose for which he has saved you for? Now, some people think that, you know, this doctrine of predestination makes you arrogant as though you can say, ha, 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 look at me, I've arrived, I'm one of the elect. No. No, what this doctrine does is it does the opposite. It makes you realize that not even my choice got me saved. It makes you realize that I did not lift a single finger to earn my eternal salvation. It was all from God. And what that does is it humbles you down to the ground. See, if you understand this, you'll say, but for the grace of God, I had no hope at all. And that will humble you. It changes your character. But see, the second th reason it's sweet is it doesn't just humble you, it, it actually lifts you up. See, some people think this doctrine makes you feel unsure because, you know, you're always worrying, am I one of the elect? But do you realize your faith is not in your election? 
your faith is in Jesus. And I hope you can see that the reason this doctrine is given to us is for our comfort, for our assurance. See, Paul goes on to say in this chapter of Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? In fact, Article 17 of the 39 articles of the Anglican Church is about predestination and it says this, it says, this doctrine is full of sweet, pleasant and unspeakable comfort to us. See, it's sweet, it's, it's to give us comfort. See, what happens to the predestined? Look again at Romans chapter 8 verse 30. It says, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. See, if you're predestined, what happens to you is you're justified. Are you justified? How do you know? How do you know that you're justified? You're justified because of faith in Jesus. That's what Romans 5 says. It says, since we have now been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In other words, the ones who trust in Jesus and call on his name, they're the ones who get justified. Why were they justified? Because God called them. Why were they called? Because they were predestined. Why were they predestined? Because they were foreknown. Do you see the argument? Do you see? If you trust in Jesus, you're chosen. <laughs> If you're someone who's resting in Jesus and in him alone to be made right with God, then that's the proof that God has planned to save you. I saw Iris this week. She turned 97. And I said to her, as we sat down to have a cup of tea, I said, Iris, what have you learnt over 97 years of life? And she said this. She said to always trust in Jesus. See, there's a woman who has been chosen her faith is the proof that she is chosen. See, from your side of the glass, it looks as though you're trusting in Jesus. But from God's side of, of the glass, you, you trust Jesus because he has chosen you. You see? Do you see what this means? If you have trusted Jesus, you don't need to worry about your future. Because God has planned your future long ago. And God doesn't change his plans. He finish, finishes what he starts. It's no accident that you're saved. Do you doubt? You know, the fact that you worry about whether or not you're one of the elect shows that you are. Because do you think an unbeliever would ever worry about this? Of course not. See, what predestination does is it gives us comfort and gives us assurance that our salvation has been planned long ago. It also gives us comfort and encouragement in evangelism, can I say? Because, you know, when I, whenever I talk to someone who isn't a believer, I know that I didn't believe because I was wiser or smarter or more undeserving um, or more deserving than anyone else. I believe because I was chosen. I'm not better than anyone else. I'm a walking miracle. God chose me and that's why I believed. And if I'm a walking miracle then God can make other walking miracles too. And I can have hope for anyone because when I share the gospel with someone, I might very well be talking to someone God has chosen. I don't know if God's chosen them or not. It gives me great encouragement for evangelism when I share the gospel because if I'm speaking to one of the elect, well, they'll be saved through my feeble words. That's what Paul took strength from. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 10, he says, This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So, how can you swallow this doctrine? In case you're still back on the first point, you're wondering that this is a hard doctrine to swallow and you're wondering how is it fair that God chooses some people for salvation. Sometimes people want to say, if God can pick anyone, why doesn't he pick all of us? But do you realize what the real question is? The real question is, given how hostile we are to God, 
and how opposed to him, why would he pick any one of us at all? Given how sinful I am and that I'm hostile to God, do you know what's fair for me? What's fair is that I deserved hell yesterday. Why would he pick any one of us in the first place when we're at war with him? How can this be possible? How can you swallow this doctrine and accept it? What's the basis of predestination? You know what it is? It's because God chose his son, his only beloved son. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew tells us what God thinks about Jesus. In Matthew 12, 18, it says, Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I delight. He was chosen. Jesus is the elect one. You know what he was chosen for? He was chosen to be rejected. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus is described as the lamb who was slain, literally from the creation of the world. God chose him to die before the world was even made. God intervened. He was chosen to pay your fine so that you could go free. He was chosen to go to hell so you could be glorified in heaven. God chose him to be cursed so you could be blessed. Long before God mapped out the creation of the world, God mapped out your salvation from beginning to end. And it involved him choosing Christ to die in your place. Isn't that a wonder? You can't detach your choosing from God choosing Christ. Christ is the chosen one. It's because of him that you were chosen. You're not chosen in and of yourself. You're chosen in him. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, For he chose us in him. Christ is the elect one. Martin Luther put it like this. He said, gaze upon the wounds of Christ and the blood shed for you. Their predestination will shine forth. You know, I remember when I was back in school and I don't know if it still happens now, but, you know, whenever a teacher would um, get us on, uh, organize uh, us to play sports, she'd get two students to pick sides, to play against each other. And they'd take turns to pick the best students, the biggest students, the most sportiest students. And I was, I was often last. And I remember just sitting there saying, come on, thinking to myself, come on, pick me, pick me, pick me. And, you know, finally, usually towards the end, someone would pick me and I'd think, oh, phew, I'm picked. I'm not, at least I'm not last. What a relief. Now, I want to say that's not how God has chosen you. That's not how he's picked you. He hasn't chosen you because of something in you. And that should be a relief to you because that thing in you could change. No, he hasn't chosen you because of anything in you. He's chosen you because he decided to put his love upon you. And you need someone to love you like that. And it's a comfort to be loved by someone like that. It's a comfort to be chosen by the king. And if your heart jumps at the fact that God has chosen you, then do you know what? That's actually a sign that he's working in your life. So make sure you go to him because he really wants you. And what happens next? Well, we'll find out next week, so make sure you, you tune in. Let me pray. Father, there are deep mysteries of the world that you have revealed to us. And one of them is that you have chosen some people to be yours. Father, we pray that we, the people of God who trust you, would find comfort in this and that we would live out our election and live to the praise and the honour and the glory of your name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.